recruiting. Good evening and welcome to the Reflective Coach Podcast with Coach Luca. I'm hoping you're loving the new updates, the new intros, the new colour schemes, the new logo and everything that comes with a new interface. And with this new interface comes a new overlay and a new complete rebrand of the Reflective Coach Podcast. I hope you love the colours and the schemes as much as I do and it's a great way to introduce it with Coach Andrew Green. It is fantastic to rebrand and build and have Andrew at the forefront of this and it's great to introduce another podcast episode for him this week as he's also been released by some very close friends and a very good podcast himself on another episode earlier on this week. So it's a great week for him in terms of podcast episodes and Andrew I appreciate you being part of the Reflective Coach podcast with myself. It is really appreciated. Now this was a very open and honest introduction into Andrew and who he was as well as what his values and beliefs are and how you can be open as a coach to support your teams. We talked about structures being in place of managers to come in and do their job and sometimes that comes in not only in coaching but in terms of the professional world as well whether you look at teachers, head teachers, CEOs, CFOs and beyond and the many magnitude of other jobs that ensure you and allow you to do that and that structure has to be in place. We talked about principles in a club in terms of how that looks for playing, uh, breaking lines, attacking, possession, superiority in the middle and using the wider players. We looked at then how that formation and adaptability of both coaching the team, the players, the roles and whether the principles comes into play. Now it's great to have Andrew's take on this and what you may look into this in terms of your own principles is really interesting and it was great to talk upon the tactical side of the game as I don't always get to talk about this with every coach that's on. Now we also talked about roles and how this looks within the team, coaches being let go at college level, uh, the principles of the team, the growth of coaches, team and the players, what moments are created, those levels and being vulnerable as a coach and as an individual. Being vulnerable to open up to your team, being vulnerable to allow them to come and introduce themselves to you, allow them to approach you as well as showing what you can do and learn as a coach as well. You must be there for your players and be the best person as well. There is a fantastic quote within this that Andrew alludes to and talks about. Being comfortable and being uncomfortable so you can open yourself up so that they the players, are trusting of you to open up to you. So if you're vulnerable as well, you're creating that relationship whereby they can understand, feel what you're going through and can then can open up to you and trust and confide in you, which then allows you to create that relationship so you can address the issues within the room and any that the player needs and wants to talk about. There is so much within this episode and it's great to talk to Andrew and his head coach role and how that looks. Unfortunately for him, he is a Manchester United fan, which was a great shame throughout the podcast episode, but it was really great to speak to him. I hope you find out more within this episode and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did because Andrew was such a wonderful interviewee. Thank you for your time, Andrew. It is really appreciated. I hope you can drop as many follows, likes, comments and subscribes as possible. It is really appreciated in helping the podcast grow and that's all I want the podcast to do so I can share it with the wonderful coaching community as well as other professionals, education and those who want to listen to the pod which is really appreciated. You can follow, like, drop and subscribe comments on TikTok, LinkedIn, Spotify, YouTube, Twitter and Pinterest. Pinterest is a new uh, social media platform that we're looking at and hoping to share even more with you. But don't forget Spotify, YouTube, Podcast Addict are the key areas for you to listen and watch. So this is Coach Luke on Reflective Coach Podcast with Andrew Green. It is really appreciated and enjoy the episode. There's moments where you can realize that this uncomfortable moment is going to help your growth, help your progression, help your... um, You get to whatever that next level is for you, right? And I think that's where... Um, for me as a coach, like, you know, there's moments where um, when you first come into a new team where, you know, you're extremely uncomfortable, right? You haven't been around this team. You don't know, you know, what the strengths are, what the weaknesses are, how they're going to take to my session, how they're going to take to my uh, vocabulary and we have our player profiles. But having the flexibility to change and being able to, to adapt to whatever the game throws at you is also a very big need, not only at the college level, but, you know, at any level that you're going to play, whether it's How are you? You okay? Yeah, hanging in there. How are you? 
Yeah, I'm good. Not bad. It's uh, nice to catch up and uh, get 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 you on the call, which is great. Yeah. Uh, I must say, I'm a little bit disappointed by the Man United sign behind you on, on that side, but uh, can't win it all. <laughs> so I'm say it's either a hit or a miss. It's it's never uh, it's never ah oh, that's okay. It's either yeah that's great or no <laughs> not having it. <laughs> yeah, that's it really. So how, being a United fan, then how do you think their season's gone from your perspective? Um, ups and downs. I mean, Ten Hag is putting some sort of stamp on what he wants, and I think you kind of have to kind of roll with it right now just because I feel like he's got to get his players in. It's proven that he's the third manager that hasn't gotten a true nine in, and that's why we don't score goals. <laughs> and, I mean, but I think it's good to have someone that, like, isn't afraid to drop players or, you know, isn't, you know, when they don't play well, he doesn't sugarcoat it. He says it to the media that we didn't play well. So it's, it's kind of been a breath of fresh air compared to the last few managers. So... Of course, and it's, it's that case of, if you look at the table, there's a big difference between United still and, and City and Arsenal um, in terms of that point difference and where they're at. And it's, it's sort of looking at, right, we've got, the, again, another manager and a rebuilding and new players coming in. And this could be a four or five year job for him and, and he could bring it in. But they could also reflect on it in a way of what Liverpool have, were at, at that stage where they didn't go on and win it for like 18 years. And that's where United are currently at is that Liverpool stage again and this, how they could look in the next five years or so. Yeah, and I think it's going to be interesting because there's going to be quite a few players that are going to be moved on, I think, <laughs> and quite a few players that have been first choice under the last few managers. <laughs> of course. So, you know, I think, you know, possibly a Maguire leaves, possibly a McTominay leaves, possibly, you know, name and name who you want, who's on loan right now, Eric Bailly, who, who, all these players that have been first choice. And so, but I think it's much needed at this point. You know, I think it started... You know, started under Ollie where we started dropping players and then, you know, now it's kind of just kind of taken off and where what is a new team's gonna look like, which is much needed in my opinion, right? So um, you know, you know, somehow Phil Jones has been there for twelve years and hasn't seen the field in, in six, so <laughs> And, and and that's it. It's it's that it's the players in the background which have just been signed and continues to be signed because it's been the easiest thing. And it's hard then because Oli, for example, you know, Maguire was that marquee signing, a lot of money was spent and yeah. being England captain at the Euros. And then essentially his hand was forced to play him and um then he had to, you know, forfeit you know um, his principles as, as manager or um, he didn't have that ruthlessness which figs and I was oh I'm dropping him he's not playing even if we have spent yeah. this amount of money um, because it, it was sort of that pressurised position that we have spent the money so he has to play and yeah. it, it's taken away from the essence of the coach in that sense then yeah yeah I agreed and you know like um, and uh, the only player that Ollie seemed he was allowed to do that with was Jesse Lingard you know mm. didn't like and at that point you're just dealing with an academy player who's been there forever not someone who you went and spent 80 million pounds on, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I think, I think it'll be good for the future as long as, you know, whatever the, whatever goes on with the ownership now. And if a sale does happen, if it doesn't happen, right. I think, you know, I think a good step was getting Ed Woodward out because, you know, he's someone who just continued to give new contracts to players who were not deserving of them. So, and I think it's finally good that Man United is finally getting with the times of having a sporting director and having, you know, not just, you know, Sir Alex did it great. You know, he did obviously one of the best managers ever, but, you know, once you, once he left, there really wasn't a plan in place of what, what are we going to do now? You know, you put it on David Moyes who had, um, you know, really didn't have the experience of being in seven different roles along with being a manager and being a coach. So I think it's it's finally good that they're getting with the time, so to say, and you know, getting a sporting director, getting a chief scout, getting things like that. Where you know, I think that's kind of what's put us behind the last five years, and that's why teams like City and Liverpool and now Arsenal and even Newcastle now are you know, it's making the top four more competitive. And you know, and I think if we want to continue to be top four and fighting for the Premier League, we just have to change. 
Absolutely, and it's quite interesting then in that sense because I was looking at something the other day, and a lot of people criticised Man City in that respect because they're like, oh, they came in, they had the billions, it's been thrown at them, and it's oil money, etc. But essentially, when you look at it and what they have done, they've put all the foundations in place which has allowed them to have that success, regardless of the money. Yeah. And it's that success which they're seeing now. They got the amazing stadium which can be expanded and, and built. Um, they got the amazing academy facilities which are doing well. They got a first team which is producing results. They got a women's team which is successful, and they've just kept building and they put the right infrastructure in so although they came in and went right we're going to buy Rabina, we're going to buy um, these players x y and z and spend yeah. this money since then they've just they, they've done nothing but build and it's put them in that really good position and Arsenal are sort of doing that similar now with, with Arteta and putting those foundations in going all oh, right this is what we can do um, yeah. and I was speaking to a, a parent the other day and his son actually plays for the Newport County Academy so they went up to Man United yeah. and they were saying their facilities for Man United in terms of the academy and youth structure are absolutely awful these days because they haven't grown with the times whereas you know City sort of have and they've kept up to date with it yeah yeah that's Obviously, being a Man United supporter is a little disappointing, but, um, you know, being someone who does coach and looks at the broader picture, like, you know, it's what's needed. Um, you know, whether, you know, I, I don't like to admit how, how well City has done it, but they've, they've done it well. You know, you look at the players that were bought before Pep Guardiola really took over. You know, they bought De Bruyne. Um, you know, they still had the pieces in with Fernandinho at that time. They still had Aguero. They had a structure set in for a manager to come in and do what he wants to do. It always seemed like with Man United, with the first team at least, it's always been, we'll get the manager in and then let him have his way with players, you know, with David Moyes buying Fellaini, um, you know, Jose Mourinho going and buying Lukaku, you know, did they really fit what Man United was about under Ferguson? No, not really. Um, but you know, I think that's where it's kind of lacked, and that's where May Night has fallen behind. It's always been, we'll adapt to what the manager wants to do rather than, you know, what are our principles as a club? How do we want to play? And that's where, you know, even like Arsenal, you know, Arteta isn't much farther off than what, um, what's his name, was before. Right? It's, it's still the same principles, really. He's just doing it on a better, better way of doing things. So I think that's one of the biggest things that Man United has always locked in is, you know, we we had an identity under Ferguson, and then once Ferguson left, it was, well, what's our identity? And we tried to be whatever the manager's identity was instead of what the club's identity is. Mm. I love that, and there's some great points there, because obviously you were appointed a head coach in January this year. So in terms of taking over as head coach then, has it been you fitting into the identity of your organization, or has it been the other way around in terms of your experience now and where you're at? Yeah, so unfortunately, um, I'm the associate head coach, which basically uh, how it works is we have a head coach who's our kind of the manager and overseas thing, and then you kind of see me as like the first team head coach. So um, basically what my boss has done is basically said as the associate head coach is that I would be able to kind of have my hands on everything, mm -hmm. right? You know, most assistants you'll have, whether you're taking, you know, a functional group or whether you're taking... Uh, goalkeeping, you know, for me, I kind of have my hands on everything now, which has been great. And it's kind of going to set me up for when I do take over as a head coach, wherever I go. Um, so for me, it's, it's been good because before it was kind of the two of us would split sessions 50, 50, we kind of have each other's voices. Now at this time, it's kind of, um, you know, he'll kind of be that CEO and oversee everything that goes on and is able to pick out um, you know, maybe some of the emotional side of the game and players not getting what they want while I'm able to focus on the tactical, the technical aspects and how training is set up, which has been, um, it's been good for me, right? It's, it's helped me kind of develop my coaching voice a little bit more so that when I'm ready to take over as a head coach, wherever I go, um, I kind of have that experience now. Um, and I'm very fortunate to work who I work for because he's kind of let me, he's basically said, you know, these are our principles, you know, what are your thoughts here? Just show me, okay, go ahead and implement it. So, um, it's kind of been nice for me and that, that's kind of where I've grown the most now is in the last six months, kind of just being able to find what my voice is as a coach. Um, cause I feel like, you know, I've been around these players now for going on my 30 season here at the, at the university. Um, 
but now I've kind of been able to switch from being the going to if you know you don't like what the head coach is here to let's have this conversation about what the tactical sense mm-hmm. is what's going on off the field while he can kind of see the big picture and I can have, kind of have the little small details. And that's good then, because as you say, it's great for your own personal development. It's great that you've got that synergy with the head coach where essentially he becomes a mentor and he's able to delegate and then you take on more responsibility and grow naturally over time, which is great for him to sort of then allocate and then it's great for you on that flip side. But when, obviously, you know, you want to be a head coach, which is your long-term ambition, which you say, um, but obviously having all this responsibility now is great, but do you find it frustrating at times that you, you can't just go ahead and go, oh, I want to do this and I have to do that in terms of those principles because you know, you, you're know you restricted in that sense because you've got that CEO above you who's making those mm-hmm. key decisions. But when you're motivated to go somewhere and you're, you, you're like, oh, I want to apply this, do you find there's some like brick wall to that at times and you're ready to break them down? Um, I haven't gotten that far yet. Um, I think maybe eventually... You know, just naturally as humans, we all want to evolve to the next step of what we want to do. And maybe that'll come um, for me. You know, I think the the best thing is the two of us kind of see the game very similarly. You know, we like to put the ball down. We like to have a lot of possession. We like to talk about um, a bit of positional play angles, being able to play through the lines and break lines and, um, you know, kind of play that attacking style of soccer, but still have possession with a purpose. Right. You know, we don't want to be. I wish we could be Barcelona from back in the day where we string together 85 passes before we go to goal. But the reality is I don't have a midfield like that. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing. I think eventually yeah, it, it, it may happen. Um, but yeah, Chris, who's my head coach, we, we've known each other for a very long time. And that's kind of what um, led me to come to Virginia Military Institute and kind of be, work under him. And now he's kind of let me have a little bit more of the, uh, a little bit more say, a little bit more control in what we do. Uh, but yeah, I think eventually, right, you know, I think the long-term goal for me is to, uh, I've kind of gone back and forth of whether I want to be a head coach or whether um, I just want to continue to be an assistant because, you know, I think there's um, a little bit of, you know, I think, I think it really depends on what you want out of what you want to do because there's times where as a collegiate head coach, um, you know, maybe the, the soccer side of being on the grass is maybe 20% of what you do. Well, as an assistant coach, that might be about 50 to 55% of what you do. Um, so, you know, it's when you're a collegiate head coach, it's dealing with, you know, administration, um, dealing with the emotional side of the game, dealing with all the other things that kind of get put on your desk throughout the day. Well, as an assistant, um, you know, a lot of it is watching the tactics, doing a lot of the analysis, um, and then some of the administrative stuff that comes on your desk, but not as much as a head coach. So that's why I've gone back and forth with it a little bit. But yeah, I think the long term goal is to eventually be a collegiate head coach um, just so I can put my stamp on things and how I want to go ahead and, you know, run a program and how I see the game being played and things like that. So but yeah, I'm very fortunate for who I work for because I think he wants to grow me as an assistant and. You know, if, if he's at, we've had conversations before about what my long-term goals are and if I want to be a head coach or if I'd like to be a higher-end assistant and maybe at a, at a very large university or in the professional game or things like that. Um, so I think the best thing about having a boss like that is just having the conversations and having them be open so that, you know, because I think he realizes that part of his job as well is to develop me as a coach and to help me move on to uh, whatever my next job is. Um so, but yeah, I think, I think long, long answer short. Yeah. I think eventually, you know, we all have that inkling to want to be in the boss's shoes and say like, yeah, I, I, they do it their way, but I think I could do it my way. And, you know, I think I could do it how I would want to do it. And maybe I can do it better. Maybe I can't, you know, things like that. And it's a great position to be in, uh, you know, as, as we touched upon earlier on, because, you know, you're able to learn, you're able to have that more responsibility given to you, you're able to reflect on, on what that manager might be doing in the sense of, oh, do you know what, actually, being a head coach isn't for me because I've seen the accountability that he has to take on, I see that he's criticised by the fans or the players or he's got to take this on or he's late meetings or um, the scrutiny, etc. And then sometimes that takes away from life then itself and actually being able to enjoy it. But, you know, some people look at assistant coaches in terms of, oh, right, you've been a 
coach and then you're going to be an assistant and then the step is to be a manager and it's accelerating through the steps but sometimes you might find a coach who goes right I'm at the assistant stage now I'm going to get off the bus and I'm happy to stay here and there's nothing yeah. wrong with that and there's nothing wrong with delaying the process as you say because some people are like oh I might put two years on that and then sit as head coach and, but for you it's you know as you say it's taking that time to find and I think that's the important message there for other coaches to take away is don't rush that journey and process too much because the grass isn't always greener but then you can always have that opportunity where you are waiting with someone so great and you can move on too quickly because you're ready to you know find it within yourself to do that but in 10 years you might go do you know i actually wish i spent two or three years with this coach to try and get as much as possible out of them and to have learned and to have put me in that better position for example yeah yeah i agree and you know i think um for me um i've stuck mainly with the college game and i've been on the youth club side a little bit here in the states and um, everywhere that I've gone, I've picked up something different. This is my uh, fifth college job. Um, so I think working for different people, I mean, everyone sees the game differently. And I think when I'm ready to step into the head coach's role, I think that um, I'll have ideas of how I want the gameplay, but I will be able to take from different pots that I've been around. And um, whether it's running a program administratively, whether it's um, tactically, uh, whether it's the analysis side, um, I think when that comes, right, I think it's I'll be ready for it. And, and I think that's the biggest thing. Like I've had opportunities before at the college game um, to be a head coach. And I, I think at that time I just wasn't ready to do it, if I'm completely honest. Um, and, and that took a lot of self, self-analysis to figure that out because a lot of people would be like, hey, you know, they want me as a head coach. And, um, you know, why, why not jump into it? And I thought that, uh, if I'm going to do it, I want to be completely ready and I want to be able to have a whole picture of how I want to do things and not kind of learn on the job, so to say. I mean, I think there is a bit of it of learning on the job when you take in a new role anyways. Um, but I think, yeah, I think most people keep rushing to what the next best job is. And, um, you know, I think for a while I did that too. This is the longest role that I've been at. I've been going into my third season, right? So I would jump after a year to year where the next best job came, but I've kind of found a place where uh, my family and I are happy here. Um, but obviously if, if something that I couldn't refuse came on the table, then we'd be having a different story. Um, but I think, yeah, for most people with your coaching journey or with however you want to you know, whatever that end goal is for you, I think you just have to figure out, you know, what can I take in each role so that when I am able to put my stamp on things, um, I know exactly what I'm talking about or what, how I want to do things. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I've, I've worked at, uh, this is my third division one Institute and each school that I've been at, I've taken something different. There's been three completely different styles of play and, um, you know, adapting to how I have to coach in those moments, you know, maybe I worked for someone who was a little bit more direct and wanted to be, um, just pump things long and we'll win it down that ends compared to when we're here, we want to put the ball down and play, right? We want to play through the thirds. We want to, you know, we talk a lot about our passing percentages. We talk a lot about, um, we have different key performance indicators that we talk about. How many times are we touching it in the final third? Um, how many times are we, um, you know, I think one of the things that we track is our sideways passes and our line breaking passes and who we have more line breaking passes and sideways passes. Um, so I think it's just different from whatever coach you work for. And I think whatever you can take and move on and, you know, take to your own coaching, I think that's great. And it's great that, that you're in that position to do that, as you say, and um, if the opportunity does come up whenever that does, uh, and you have to move your family potentially, is that in the back of your mind then to you know uproot them and move them as sort of a, a, a tough point for you in your life, or is that something where you're like, oh, I'll just see it when the time comes? Yeah, I, I think my wife and I, um, we have pretty honest conversations about it. There's there's some jobs that we, we've talked about where it's just like, yes, yeah, that became an opportunity you know, without a doubt, we would completely just go ahead and pursue it. Right? And there's some jobs that, you know, when I've had conversations with other schools where it's just like, yeah, I don't know, like the, the area, uh, you know, the, the support from the school, the support from the administration, right? You know, is this something that you really want to go in and fight this uphill battle? Yeah. So I think for my wife and I, we just have pretty honest conversations about this. Um, 
we've been together for six years and married for two. Um, so um, she kind of has the idea of how how this all works, really. And, you know, this is the first time that we've kind of uprooted um, from my last job and moved to Virginia here. Um, so I think it really depends. And obviously in any coaching world and any sport, especially here in the U.S., like if you're not getting a job within two to three hours of where you live, it is an uprooting process, right? You know, it's, it is such a large country and there's so many opportunities that, you know, whatever kind of comes up, like for instance, if an opportunity came up for me in California at a, at a, the right school, you know, um, you know, it, it, it would be a process to move. It wouldn't just be a, uh, Hey, let's take a week, pack our things and move. So, um, I think it's just having those honest conversations and, you know, we, we talk about it all the time and, you know, we've talked about, you know, what would happen if I was a head coach and, and different places at different levels. And, um, I'm very lucky and very, very to have a supportive wife like that, who is, mm-hmm. you know, basically said like, Hey, you know, if it happens, it happens and we'll figure it out. Um, so yeah, I think it's just being honest and having, you know, a plan if something like that does happen. And it's great that you've got someone so supportive who's ready to, to move with you and see what happens and yeah. already have those open conversations because, you know, I'm just trying to build on that perspective for young coaches and, you know, I'm 26 myself and it's yeah. that considerate, like, I haven't got kids, I'm not married, so I'm in that yeah. perfect position of when I do finish my degree, what do I want to go and do and am I ready to step and do things before I have that family, etc. Or is it, yeah. do I work on what I'm doing here and then see what happens and then uproot? And it's just those sort of considerations which is, quite scary to have and, and long term sort of consider but it's also about enjoying here and now so it's it's that nice mix yeah. of where you're at and position that you're in which is great to hear and uh well big uh big well done to your wife and lucky to have someone yeah. like her <laughs> yeah very, very very lucky you know i've had i've had a couple coaching friends where um you know they, they get let go from the college game and they have to stay in that area and find a club coaching job in the youth side so yeah very very lucky, very supportive. She was a college athlete, so she kind of understands the whole side of it. She never got into the coaching side. Um, so, but she kind of understands how it works. And, you know, it's, it's nice that this, uh, she played volleyball in college. So um, it's kind of nice to also go home and have someone who has zero idea of what I'm talking about when I start talking about tactics or start talking about what so-and-so did in training. And she's just like, yeah, that, that, I don't know what to tell you. I was like, yeah, it's nice to have that when you go home and a little bit of getaway Mm. and things like that. Of course, and, and that's good as well to have that sort of getaway because, you know, I speak to a lot of coaches and they struggle with that getaway because they're constantly football, football, football or soccer and, yeah. you know, sport in the back of their mind and sometimes it's just like, you know, have a break and I know that I've learned over the last seven and a half years whereas, you know, I would have been at this point where our season would have finished and it would be festivals and I'd be already having friendly games and then I'd maybe have two weeks tops to break and then straight back into pre-season yeah. whereas I'm quite lucky now this year, I got under 19s and I'm like, you know what, we're going to have two months off because boys you're working you're finishing school yeah. you go and spend time with the girlfriends go on holidays just have that downtime and we're gonna have next season to go again because there's there's already plenty of games that you played this year there's gonna be plenty more next year and if this is the life that you want to take in then games are going to be there as long as you want them to be there yeah yeah it's something that has taken me up until our son was born to kind of um have that balance and work-life balance um, you know, I talk to our team about it all the time because they ask me questions about just life and things like that. And I said, yeah, it took me up until about nine months ago when my son was born to to kind of have a little bit of balance and just knowing that when I go home, it's um, you know, it's it's difficult to turn off from from the the game and you know coaching and things like that. But you know, I think in order to have some sort of balance in life, you know, it, it's something that I've had to make a conscious effort to do. Um, you know, the biggest thing, like I I say, is even during our fall season, when it's the busiest time of the year, um, when I go home, I take three to four hours with my wife and son, put my phone aside, put my computer aside, you know, once they go to sleep, maybe then I'll turn the computer on and do a little analysis and, you know, maybe make some recruiting phone calls and things like that. But, um, it's definitely taken some time and, you know, finding hobbies outside of the game has, that's definitely been it. I, I, I enjoy a bit of golf. I enjoy um, watching other sports. Um, so it, it's definitely something that as a younger coach and didn't have a family and, you know, didn't have a wife, um, it, it was 
it was kind of, I didn't have anything else to do. So, you know, turn on, you know, our match and do a little analysis and, you know, would be out recruiting and would be, you know, maybe taking two to three weeks off a year and just that constant grind of, you know, what's next, what's next, what's next. Um, but now that, you know, I have a family involved and it's, it's definitely taken a bit of a conscious effort from myself to just make sure like when I get home, um, you know, computer goes away, phones go in my bedroom, you know, enjoy the time with my wife and son. Once that's over, you know, then, then we can kind of switch off, but it's just taken a little bit of a conscious effort on my part. And I think that's really important because there's someone that I'm working with, who I worked with this weekend, and we were having a, a meeting at the end of the day about some of the young people that we work with in an education factor, and she looked mm-hmm. just run down, knackered, shattered, and she's in till half six every day, and I'm realistically thinking, well, okay, you're doing your job, you're doing it very well, you're staying on top of it, mm-hmm. but realistically, how much time are you spending with your family? Because, you know, by the time you get home, then you're late, you're knackered, and then I've had emails mm-hmm. from like nine o'clock, ten o'clock at night, and um, I'm like, what does this really mean? in the long term are these kids that going to remember that actual decision that you made six o'clock one night ten years ago yeah. really going to matter and the answer is no so I'm like could you cut down your workload and let's just streamline what you're doing because you know go home spend time with your family and in ten years all those decisions that you didn't make they're probably going to have the same impact as if you had them made them as well because these kids are not going to remember every point in terms of that and you know that's a behavior perspective and not you know yeah. coaching or whatever but there's just sometimes just scraping that off and remembering that we've got lives as well and not fast forwarding it too much because as you say you've got a young son but if you were to be out recruiting every weekend and watching analysis then picking up emails then he's 10 years of age before you've even known it you know yeah 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 and it's, it's definitely something like you know i, I think this spring um uh, because how the college season has spread up into the fall and into the spring um, you know, the spring is definitely something where, um, we make it a, a point to be done with training by, you know, six, seven o'clock at night. Um, and then I have the rest of the night with my family. Um, and there's even times where like my, I, I'm very, like I said, I'm very fortunate who I work for. Um, you know, it's, Hey, if you're taking your son to school this morning, you know, just you know, come in after that. Don't worry about coming in at eight o'clock. Don't come in, worry about coming at nine, you know, drop them off, enjoy your time, then come to the office. Um, so I think, yeah, like you said, like most, I think most players don't realize, you know, we do have a life outside of, outside of sport. Um, but you know, like you said, are you, are you going to remember that decision that you made at 10 o'clock at night, not sleeping, or are you going to remember going to your son's first football game? Right. So I think that's the way that he's kind of, he's always joked with me. He's like, if you ever miss anything for your son, I will fire you. And that's a joke. But, um, so I think I'm very fortunate. Like I said, I'm very fortunate who I work for. I'm very fortunate, you know, to have someone who values that balance. Of course, and, and I love that there, and I think it's that importance of taking that time because you know I look at it, when I was highly motivated a lot more than I was now, and I'm at a position where I still got motivation, but I've cut a bit off because I'm like just enjoy what I'm doing here and now because I was using too much of that motivation, and I remember taking a training session and missing my dad's graduation day because of it, and I'm like realistically I've missed that, and I, how many of the players or the coaches that I worked with back then remembered that I missed it, and probably zero to none because all of them who I work with them are all now gone out of the club anyway so those who are now in charge it doesn't really impact but yeah it's impacted me and and my dad because I missed out on that graduation just to take this training session so that was a big learning curve for me because I tried looking at the top managers who are getting paid millions of pounds by the way who are making those sacrifices and I was like well if I was being paid million pounds then of course I might be in a position where I could justify that but at the yeah. end of the day, you know, I wasn't, I'm not at that level. So that's something that consciously lives with me uh, and something that I re- regret in that sense. And I know people say don't live with regret, but that is one regret that I live with where I know I'm not going to make that mistake again. I'm very aware of that. So, you know, it's great that, that you've got a coach in, and it, it works out better then because as that associate head coach uh, uh, right now, it also, you know, as you say, you've got someone who's supporting you and you can share that balance where it allows you to, crack on with life rather than being in the manager spot and taking all that responsibility. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, like I said, it's something that, um, as I've gotten older and I'm still pretty young, I'm only 32 years old. So, um, it's something that is some that I've had to change throughout my life to, as I got married and had a son and 
you know, and as I start to look, as we talk about looking for different roles, you know, it's something that has definitely come up, you know, if I ever get into an interview process of, you know, what is your take on, you know, work-life balance? Mm -hmm. And I, at this point, you know, maybe I would work for someone who val doesn't value it as much, but I don't know if I'd work for someone who said like, yeah, you've got to be in at 6 a.m. We don't leave till 8 p.m. You know, you'll, you'll have to make different arrangements and things like that. So, um, you know, I, I think it's just something that as you get older and as you see, you know, what levels you continue to coach at and what you value and, you know, what, you know, what you value in your, in who you're working for and the club you're working for or the university you're working for, you know, I think it's just something that as those interview processes come along, you know, is that, is that something that you should ask? Yeah, absolutely. If that's something that you value and, you know, what is their take on it? And if it doesn't, um, if it doesn't match with your values, you know, is it something where you're going to be happy in that role? Um, is it something where, you know, is it, like you said, it's something where you're going to be there short term and you're going to be miserable. So I think it's just something to definitely consider as people move along their coaching journeys. Absolutely. Um, and as where you're at now, you you have a wide range of experience and, and inputs, which you currently do. So, you know, whether that's coaching, talent ID and slash recruitment, you know, analyzing games and taking training sessions, working with players, you know, maybe the pastoral side, etc. Is there a sort of side of it that you enjoy the most? So whether it might be the analyzing side or recruitment, is there one that you have particular interest in the most um yeah i think definitely the recruitment side and the analytic side of the game um obviously i do enjoy uh being on the grass and and running training sessions and um but i think that kind of fits into the analysis side of the game with the tactical side um uh, but yeah those are two of the base, biggest things that i kind of in, enjoy and i think at the college level it gets you uh, a little bit of both because obviously, you know, recruitment is how you keep your program alive and how you continue to get better and how you continue to grow your roster. And, um, and obviously the analysis side is kind of that development side of the, of the game. And, um, you know, especially the college side, uh, it's become a little different now with how uh, transferring between college to college has come. But um, I think at most schools where you're getting someone at, 17 18 years old and developing them through four years i think those are two of the biggest sides that i enjoy the most and when it comes down to then recruiting a player uh, is it then heavy biased in your mind that you are possession based that you are attacking that you are maybe breaking lines or is it looking for a balanced all-rounded player and then going right we could get them to do that uh i think it's a little bit of both like obviously we have player profiles for each position um you know like for us um, we at times use our fullbacks a little bit more inverted. So maybe, um, instead of looking at a true out and out fullback that overlaps and that gets in behind, um, you know, we may be recruiting a number eight to play a fullback because they're more of someone who can sit in the gaps and be able to keep possession and, um, be able to cycle the ball. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it obviously depends. Like, obviously I don't want to turn down one of the biggest talents if they're interested in us. Um, and, and if they are that talented, we can probably make them fit into what our system is. Um, but I think there are different um, profiles for each player that we kind of value. And I think in the modern game and being a possession-based team, you know, um, we like having ball-playing center backs, right? Mm -hmm. And I think nowadays your center backs have kind of turned into your playmakers almost when you're in possession. So we value someone who can be on the ball, who is uh, very smart when they're on the ball and who can – be able to play a, a line breaking ball, but can also know when to keep possession and when to cycle. Um, so yeah, we have different profiles for each um, each position that we recruit. Um, you know, there there we do look for a little bit of variety when it comes to our, our forward lines. You know, I think at times you want to have a true nine that can hold the ball up and that can you know, let players get them behind. But I think at times, you know, when the game calls for something different. Can you have a nine who can run in behind and who can, you know, look to play off the center back shoulders and play be slipped in behind. So I think the recruitment side of things, yeah, it's, it's most fun for me because it's kind of seeing um, what those skill sets are in that player and how we can put them into our system, but also seeing like what those skill sets are and where they fit positionally. So. And that's great to hear because I come in in the academy system here in, in Wales and uh, one of the academies that I work for play the 3-5-2 base system and unless a player were, was able to fit into that 3-5-2 then essentially then the player weren't fitting into the profile of the academy. But when a new academy manager came in he sort of changed that. He said, look, 
you know, we're going to have a profile in terms of what we expect in the academy and our expectations now we recruit. But if we've got an all-rounded balanced player which is going to come in and become an asset to us and maybe a player that we can make money off, then that's the sort of player that we need to start looking at in that sense. And it was just kind of interesting to see the different sort of uh, perspectives and approaches from, say, two different academy managers in terms of how one was happy to discard his players because he wanted to the principles of his system to uphold and then one who was happy to get players to fit in regardless of the principles to look at, say, the operational sense and the asset sense and look at the business side. So it was quite an interesting take on, on both the sort of um, have in, in terms of that. Yeah, yeah, I think... Um, and, you know, obviously at times you know, you're playing... Sometimes against different uh, teams, we're playing different shapes and different systems. And you know, I think if you have a team that is all built for one system and one style of play, and you know, just can't really adapt to games, there's and you come up against someone who is better than you, and you have to change, right? I think that's where you kind of run into those roadblocks of not being able to to change, right? And I think like when you have you know, obviously having player profiles, we're very structured in what we look for. But like I said, we look for some different kinds of players at different positions, right? Because I think um, if we're playing against someone who's going to play a very low block and going to sit in, right, that's maybe where we want our fullbacks to be a little bit more inverted, have a little bit of uh, numer numerical superiority in the middle, um, and, you know, and be able to use our wide players to kind of isolate them and get them wide and get balls in. Um, but if we're playing against a team that's going to be in transition the entire game, right? I think that's where we want to have true fullbacks who can, you know, get up and down and be able to deal with pace out wide and be able to defend those moments. So I think just having, um, yeah, it's great. Like I said, we have our, um, we have our player profiles, but having the flexibility to change and being able to, to adapt to whatever the game throws at you is also a very big need, not only at the college level, but, you know, at any level that you're going to play, whether it's the club, college, professional, right? I think there's, I think for, you know, for collegiate players that look to play professional, um, especially on the women's side in the U.S., right, you're probably going to change to what you were doing at the college level just because of the different um, patterns, different managers, um, you know, so I think it's being able to have that flexibility is really key to what are college players have. And that's great to hear. And when it comes down to adapting and that flexibility, then, as you say, you know, you, you want superiority in the middle or breaking lines or attacking or possession based and, you know, those ball playing centre backs. So if you're possession based playing out from the back, you're two one down, you want to um, consistently play by trying to get the ball through and build up and then go and score. Um, but if it was a case of then, right, you've got, say, eight minutes to go and um, you're seeing an opportunity to break the line straight from your centre back and getting it straight up to that nine, the nine then holds it up splits the line and you're gone rather than that build up possession place um is that something that you'd be willing then to sacrifice in the last eight minutes or would it be we are possession based and that's how we're sticking um yeah i, th I, th I think we all want to win the game i think we all want to draw uh, find a way to win the game at the end of the day and you know i i think some coaches stick to their principles no matter what and i think that you know at times we do have to change tiny bits here right if it's saying that hey you know, the ball into the nine is on right away. Um, then how can we get into our nine, play down, and then break another line to get up behind, right? So I think we're still, you know, a little bit more direct in our possession, right, at that moment. But I think it's, you know, finding a way to to get results. And I think, you know, especially at the collegiate level and any higher levels, right, you know, our, unfortunately, our jobs are based on results. Mm. Um, so as horrible as that sounds from some people, but, you know, I think, you know, we have to find a way to get a result at the end of the game. And, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's not totally going away. You know, I'm not going to just play, uh, I don't know, three, three, four and push everyone forward and just try and play off the nine and try and get people in behind the entire game. But if you're pushing for a late winner and, you know, you have to make it a little scrappy, I think that that's just something that we have to do to find a, be a little flexible to win the game. Mm -hmm. And that's that's just a question that I ask because you see some coaches and they've got a certain style of play and um, I know I was a, a, a little bit um, 
um, placed it in that category a few years ago because no matter how, I wanted my team to play one way and that is the way that we were going to play. And you see coaches getting uncomfortable and uh, adapting to that. And um, But I've become a, a lot more lenient this year. I may have my principles and I know in the back of my mind I've got Joe Zerini and he says, never change principles, your principles stay true. So I'm like, oh, yeah. how can I stick to that? But then I'm like, well, sometimes I need to deviate because I like to play a 4-1-3-2 holding with a midfielder. Mm-hmm. Um, but this t- a couple of times this year we've gone to a 4 3 3 a 4 Four two, um, and we've lost that holding midfielder, or we've gone into a low block. Then we've counter attack rather than be attacking a possession based or a balanced team. And um, sometimes those principles have changed from game to game and upon reflection. But in terms of our expectations and non-negotiables, they've still been the same right across those say four game period. Um, and I think it's it's that importance for me this year where we have been able to sacrifice the principles, but those non-negotiables have still been there, um, and it's led to us getting some really good results and reducing the players. So I think. You know, there's an important message there. As much as you do have principles, you don't have to be a stickler for them, or you don't always have to be unwilling to sacrifice uh, a result because you were unwilling to sacrifice your team changes or principles. In that sense, yeah, and I think there's definitely um, a time and a place for that, right? I think at the really young levels, right? You know, um, you know, I've always, you know, at the really young levels, right? I don't think like winning and losing at you know, under 12s is really the, the, the measure of how development is, right? It's, you know, what your principles are. And, you know, like there's a big joke in the youth level here is, you know, like, you know, what championships are you winning with 11 year olds, right? You're really there for development. And, you know, I think most people, like if I was coaching, I've never coached that level, but I think if I would, you know, I would more value, you know, how many passes did we complete that game? You know, how many times did we get them behind? How many shots off did we get rather than the score, right? But I think for our, you know, for higher levels, you have to be flexible, right? You know, I think, you know, the biggest thing, um, you know, so watching some teams, you know, if you're Southampton going against Arsenal, right, at the top of the table, right, you can't stay in your principles unless you want it to be 7-0, right? I think you have to change uh, from game to game depending on that, right? Like you said, the non-negotiables can be there, right? This is how we want to play. This is how... Um, you know, this is what we value. This is how we want our team to be. But, you know, if, if the tactic call for, you know, hey, the ball onto the winger is available right away, there's no point in playing six passes mm-hmm. to then get to that space eventually. Um, so I think, you know, I think it really depends on your level, right? The, the really young grassroots levels, you know, um, kind of looking for what those performance indicators are of, you know, passing completion, um, you know, get, how many times did you get them behind, things like that, rather than valuing the score. But obviously for uh, for the higher levels, right, the score does matter because the results are how we keep our jobs. Um, so I think it's, you know, like you said, being able to, to adapt to different moments and being able to, you know, not really change, like you said, not change your systems, but, you know, still keep your values and keep your non-negotiables but find a way to be successful and it's about finding that way to be successful which is you know really important and um that, that takes a difference between being you know a championship manager maybe to that premier league manager but um yeah. being adaptable is key and i, I absolutely love that and, and the key points there which we've spoken about but um you know is there a typical formation that you've tended to play over this course of the season or um so We've, um, we've kind of experimented with a couple of different shapes. Uh, this past fall, we played um, little. We started with a three back, and then we moved to um, a four-one-four-one because we were getting really ex- we were getting really exposed in the wide spaces. Um, just like you said, we like to play with that holding midfielder, that true six. Um, we have kind of moved now to a true four-three-three. Um, just the way that we want to, to press out of possession, it kind of gives us a little bit more numbers higher up the field um, because we were playing a 4-1-4-1 more in like a mid-block, um, trying to baiting to areas and then pressing. You know, we've kind of moved our team to a little bit more of a high-pressing team, and I think our shape, the 4-3-3, has kind of given us um, a little bit hot, more numbers higher up the field, and it's kind of given us the ability to squeeze one side of the field and to be able to, um, move numbers to whatever side we really want to bait them to. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've experimented with different shapes. Um, but yeah, I think 
a four back and really having, like you said, a true defensive midfielder, a true number six is really what we have been the most successful out of. And it's great that the you've you experimented with shapes this year to try and find the the right balance and to try and suit that system. And you know it, it's something that you can take away and build on in the future. Whereas when you are a head coach, you might go, Do you know what? I'm not keen on a three five two. So automatically, that's not a, a way that I'm going to play. Um, I know that I'd like a three five two, but it's something that I've never really deployed because I'm not really truly comfortable in, in the players that I've had so far to implement a three five two in in terms of the the expectations on my team this year. And I know where I've taken over my under 19s team this year they played a very heavy 3-5-2 with their last manager and we haven't tended to do that this year because there's only about eight players existing from last year's group in terms of what we've had this year so those eight players were like oh we want to play a 3 5 2 it suits us really well it's like no it suits you eight but how many players do we have a field 11 so therefore you've got three players who are uncomfortable then you take out someone who might be injured might not be available so then we've got then less players who are comfortable with it and then we've got the bench so realistically we're flipping it more to being uncomfortable comfortable with it than comfortable so it is something that they struggle with adapting because they played in that system um but you know it, it, it ended up moving away from players being uncomfortable to play in that system then and i'm all about exposing players to new systems and way of doing things and maybe in new positions because they've always been like oh i've played in this position that's always it but sometimes you know playing in one which could really sacrifice the results of a team and it's not always results driven but those results can affect you know motivation etc so sometimes it is looking at that bigger picture to really be considerate of all oh, right we're better off actually not doing this because of x y and z my actually benefit from it yeah yeah i I think um obviously at the college level we're a little bit uh more i don't want to say fortunate but we have uh so many players in our recruitment that come from different playing backgrounds different playing styles and kind of getting them to buy into what we want to do um so i think that's part of the recruitment process here in the college level um but yeah there was a time where you know youth soccer here in the u.s at the highest level everything was A 4-3-3, high-pressing, playing out of the back. Everything was so uh, one way of thinking so that when you came to a a team at the collegiate level, um, and let's say you did play a 3-5-2, you had players that had no idea how to do that. Um, Obviously, we've evolved and we've changed a little bit. This was probably about five years ago when the highest level was at that factor. But, yeah, I think think the best thing that – um, some youth players can realize is maybe you're a winger on your youth level, right? You might be playing fullback at the college level just because, you know, you might be better utilized there. Mm. Um, and being able to have that um, flexibility and being able to change and, you know, it's probably going to get you on the pitch faster if you have that flexibility, um, especially if you come into a new team, um, especially if you come into the college level where um, you're coming in where there are, you know, at our level, there are girls who are 18 years old playing against 22, 23 year olds that are seniors in college right now. So if you can be flexible to find yourself on the field faster, I think that's good for the development of the player. I think you know I look at um, especially here in the U.S. on the on the professional level, um, there's so many collegiate players on the men's side that start as a winger and then go to the MLS as a fullback, mm. or that start as a um, a central, a number six, a number eight that end up being a center back at the professional level. So um, being able to have that flexibility is how you're going to continue to progress to the next level. I mean, different managers, different coaches are going to have different ways of playing. So however you can find yourself on the field, I think that's best for overall happiness, right? Nobody wants to really sit on the bench and, you know, your be- the best way for you to get on the field. Absolutely, I love that you say from winger to fullback might be you know something that a player has to sacrifice and end up doing because you know I, I relate on to a, a great point that I was going to say because I've had a winger this year and there's a couple of times when I've had to put him at fullback because I've been limited on choices at the back and I've had to put him there because he's got the adaptability, he's got the pace, he's got the strength, he can track back, he understands positioning um, and I know his dad then actually messaged me and said he's never played there why is he playing there and then I had to list all those reasons like well he's gone from the wing which he can then just adapt to being a wing back I said where he's always been attacking then he actually offers something now at left back where we're more attacking in that position rather than a defensive and it might then open up options for us then to look at different ways of playing um, I said it then exposes him to another position which he's never done before he's learning etc um, and then if we are short or, or we have players who are ahead of him in terms of the attacking positions available 
available, then it might actually guarantee him some more minutes and more stats. So realistically, he's having more benefits out of that rather than, all oh, right, he's only playing winger and therefore, right, oh, we got more players available now. So therefore, he's on the bench. So it was trying to open up that thinking of supporting that young player because, as I said earlier on, you know, you might have players or parents who might come forward and go, oh, well, they've only ever played that position. So that's the only position that they're aware of. And it's like, realistically, well, no, all you've done is actually limit them over those years because yeah. you have to move around the, the pitch to get to, you know, somewhere where you might be comfortable. So you might find a great player who's been great at, you know, a cam, but then suddenly they might fit into a, a really good um, left-sided player because they understand the attacking route and then they've got the pace and they've been limited to the pace, so they might open up on the left side and therefore their assists increase, etc. So it's that great game of coaching which we play um, <laughs> and just trying to get the, the great outcomes and hoping everyone gets on board with it, but um, that's where we're at. Yeah. Um, um, obviously, there's going to be pushback for people who are uncomfortable. And um, I think one of the biggest things that I've tried to adapt in my coaching along is, you know, I talk to my players all the time, you know, I, I think the hardest thing in life is to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm. Right. And I think for me as a coach, yeah, there's times where I'm extremely uncomfortable with things. Like when I'm trying to figure out, you know, what system this team we're playing against, how we're going to expose them, where they're beating us, what the change is. Right. And I'm just asking you to play a different position. <laughs> um, so I, I think just those moments where you can realize that this uncomfortable moment is going to help your growth, help your progression, help your, um, you get to whatever that next level is for you. Right. And I think that's where, um, for me as a coach, like, you know, there's moments where, um, when you first come into a new team where, you know, you're extremely uncomfortable, right. You haven't been around this team. You don't know, you know, what the strengths are, what the weaknesses are, how they're going to take to my session, how they're going to take to my, uh, vocabulary and the way that I say things. And, and I think those moments where you can just continue to grow and continue to realize that this is a moment where we're going to get better. I think that's for the best. I love that. And that's such a great quote, which I'm going to clip out later on and just make a note of the time, but it is true. And it's great to have those moments and those reflections and um, opportunities for growth, which is really important because um, as you say, we're there to support the players and it's all about them understanding that they're going to be part of that journey and that they're going to consistently be pushed out their parameters, etc., cetera, and um, trying to find where they're at. Um, and when it comes down to it, working with players is trying to open up that mindset. And that can be the most difficult thing of when working with a player. And do you find, working with players on a one-to-one -one basis or away from the field or on the field um, uh, the best approach of working with their mindset is how do you go about approaching you know that change of psychology as such yeah I, I, that's a great question um, I think it really depends on the relationship that you have with that player um, you know that was the first thing when I came into this new role as I tried to get to know every player on the team uh, it took me a little while and it took me um you know, probably about the first three months to develop a relationship, which was unfortunate because we were already, you know, halfway through our fall season at that point. But, um, and that's something that I do throughout the recruitment process here um, is just try to develop that relationship so that when these hard conversations happen or, you know, when something that they're uncomfortable with, you know, they have no problem texting me and say, hey, let's meet. Um, so, yeah, I think the one-on-one -on -one meetings have been great, obviously. Um, for tactical questions, for um, for watching film together, like I, I, I always have, a, I have a TV in my office here so that they can come down here and watch film whenever they want. Um, but yeah, when it comes to some of those harder questions, yeah, I think uh, the one-on-one -on -one approaches have always been great. You know, I think one of the biggest things that we always say is if there's something going on, hey, let's sit down, let's have a coffee, let's talk. Um, you know, let me buy you a coffee and we'll we'll have a chat about it, right? Um, and then we'll try and get to the solution of it, right? And I think it all starts with having the relationship with the players, right? And them having your trust to know that they're, you're there for their best interests, right? And obviously, um, you know, coaching is a little bit of a different one because you, you, want, you want to be there for your players and you want to have their best interest. And, you know, but it's also finding that fine balance of being their coach and rather than being a friend or being, you know, someone like that. And I think... I've finally gotten that balance down where I have the trust of players to, to text me of, you know, things that are going on in their personal life or things that are going on um, on the field. Um, so I think it's just being able to build those relationships and they, they do take a while and they take, you know, myself being a little bit, uh, being a little vulnerable and, you know, having 
uh, the ability to show who I am. And, you know, one of the biggest things that I always tell my players, um, you know, you're part of my family. My family's always around the team. My wife, my son is always here every game. You know, they know my wife. They come and talk to her about things. Um, they're always hanging out with my son. So I think just having the, the vulnerability to just open up and, you know, being able to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, yeah, it's, it's scary. And like I said, it goes back to the whole being uh, comfortable with being uncomfortable, but, you know, just being able to kind of open yourself up so that they're trusting of you to open that up to you. Again, I really love that, and there's so much in that which I think is going to be another great quote and, 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 and something to mention there. But when it comes down to building that trust in those relationships with the players and opening up that vulnerability, um, is there, do, you then, do you tend to plan in some sort of activity around getting to know players and, and, and things around that at the start of the season, or is that just more of a gradual process, get to know them as training and games go on in the course of the season for you? Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, we do have a a little bit of planned uh, team bonding and, you know, team get togethers and team dinners and things like that. But it's also just me, you know, taking an interest in their life um, outside of soccer at times, right. You know, it's, it's talking to them about, you know, how are your classes today? You know, how's your family doing? Um, you know, we have a lot of girls who I would say probably two thirds of our team are not from the state of Virginia. So they're flying from away from home. You know, how are you doing being away from home? Um, so I think, you know, there is a little bit of planning in my mind of, you know, questions that I can ask and, you know, get down to the deep root of things, you know, like I think for, you know, for one of our girls, it's, you know, you know, how, how are you doing being away from home? You know, how are you doing, um, with the soccer side? How are you doing with the academic piece? Um, you know, is there anything you ever need from me? If you want to come down to my office, you know, obviously more than welcome to, you know, watch the watch film, or if you want to come out down and just turn on the Premier League, you know, and just hang out and watch, or if you want to turn on Netflix and just you need a, an escape away from, you know, whatever you're doing. It's just having those moments of, um, you know, the little bit of, like I said, a little bit of vulnerability to to just open up to them, and you know, they always ask me about, you know, how's my son, how's my wife, you know, how are things like that. So it's kind of having those open conversations of uh, knowing what they're doing and you know knowing a little bit about their life and you know just knowing that you're there for them and how can you help and how you know what can you do to make sure that they're feeling comfortable again so much in that which is is great to have and, and take away again but i think it's a key consideration especially working with young players and working with people in itself and um just the moments that we spend because um, you know, the the great thing is, or, or you know, as, as people say in terms of that awareness, is that we spend more time with the people that we work with than our actual family members. And that's a key consideration because then, you know, if you've got young people then who are, you know, traveling really far and then they're making that commitment to, you know, uh, the, the, the university and playing in the team, etc. You know, just having someone who can understand them, get to know them, get to know their interests, what they likes, the way they tick, can actually be the great difference in terms of them enjoying this period of life, as well as, you know, going through the the experience of trying to become a, a pro um but also to try and build these long-term connections with yourself um but you know i think it's just so important and um you know, it's just the little things, and I'm quite big on the little things. And I know when I started a new job um, in a school this year, I started in, in, in November. When it come to Christmas, my boss didn't give me a Christmas card. Whereas I've come from a, a boss who would, would have got me a Christmas card, an advent calendar. We would have had like a team, you know, um, gift session. And it's just like the little things like that. And it's like, oh, well, I didn't get a Christmas card. And for me, it's just like the little things which can make an absolute difference. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think... You know, one of the biggest things that um, in, in our preseason period, we normally open my house up and we'll have a team barbecue. Um, you know, just come on over, have some drinks, have some food, you know, just enjoy each other's company being off the field. Um, you know, as a staff, we're very good about that. Um, you know, the spring two or three times, it was always come on over to the house. You know, we'll have a barbecue. We'll just relax, you know, talk about things outside of soccer. Um, so yeah, I think the biggest thing for you, like you said, the little things that matter. And I think people notice the little things, mm -hmm. right. And I think they notice when you're taking an interest in their life outside of, outside of the game. Um, so, you know, whether that's from a coaching perspective, you know, coach to coach, uh, coach to player, even, even player to player. Right. And I think, you know, realizing that, um, uh, being here for them more than just a footballer, um, mm -hmm. You know, I think they realize that that's more important because there's such a small percentage that are going to 
play and professionally after after this level right you know you know so it's kind of taking you know what what is that next step of your life if you realize that you're probably not going to play professionally you know how can i help you be the best person in the workforce possible how can i be that resource for you how can i be um how can i just be there for you right mm-hmm. like how can i help you progress to what that next stage of your life is and that, that that's difficult for them young person because they don't know what their next stage of their life might be and you know it's about finding out what will happen for them as they grow older and just go through the the motions so it's great that you you're going to be there to support them through that because you know as you say they, they don't know so they just need someone to maybe guide them or just to ask how they are and i think sometimes we get it's too much about the detail on the pitch and getting them through a session and this is the expectations rather than going all oh, right there, there's actually young people at the, the heart here we can actually switch off from an intense session this week because we've had six on the banks we've had a tough game schedule so this week might just be you know small sided games and just breaking up the intensity and just then maybe having a chat with the players and I know I, I was I was quite big on having a rival activity so when players were arriving it just meant that they had something in which they could focus on which meant then mm-hmm. I could have one to one conversations or I can just go around chatting to the players about their day and then get into a warm up and then go on the session and then just chat to them throughout with, within those little transition periods so if they're going to get going out and get and a drink and when a player comes back quicker you know, just say oh how's your day gone and just those little things which you know you can get into a session just you know that takes 30 seconds that that can really open up that relationship and, and build with a team yeah yeah exactly i think um and not only that you know i think the more that i think one of the oldest quotes that i heard at the beginning of coaching was you know they don't know how much you or they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care hmm. um so I think that, you know, that's something that I've always taken in the back of my mind um, is players are going to work harder for you if they know how much you care and how much you, they, you really want to be there for them. Um, so I think just, like I said, knowing them, knowing a little bit about their background, even like you said, just asking how their day was, right? I think that's, that's such a big thing. And I know like for me, like, you know, they'll come up to me and they'll be like, hey, Andrew, how was your day? You know, oh, well, it, was, it was all right, you know, and, you know, so you know, it just knows that, you know, someone's asking how you were. And I think that's a, a big proponent of when you want, and I, I think that kind of comes into the man management side of things, you know, um, and just knowing, knowing your team, knowing your players and, you know, knowing what you're going to get. And that, that's great. You know, if a player can ask how your day's gone, sometimes replicating that back can actually mean quite a lot to us because, you know, we work with a number of players, we work with a lot of expectations, etc. And just having those questions back can uh, really mean the world to us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Andrew, it's been brilliant speaking to you, and I know I, I appreciate your time. But before I let you go, I'm going to throw some quick fire questions at you. Um, so, number one, if you had someone describe you in three words, what three words would they be? Oh, um, passionate, um, competitive. Oh, definitely competitive. Uh, hardworking. Love them. Love them. Um, if you could move to any country to coach him, what co- country would it be? Oh, um, my wife and I have visited England a few times, and I think she would appreciate if I moved to England. I think, yeah, I think if I could move to England, we'd move to England. Yeah, as crazy as that sounds. So, in that sense, then say the Man United job was on the line, and it's a one-time offer, and the USA national team was a one-time offer, um, and they were both presented in front of you. Which one would you take? I don't know how I could turn down the Man United job, um, whether it's the men's or the women's. Uh, that, that'd be really tough to turn down, so probably the Man United job. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> um, if you could spend the day with any coach or manager then, who would it be? Um, I think the obvious answer for me being uh, a Man United supporter would be Sir Alex Ferguson, but I, I, as much as people are going to hate me for saying this, I really respect Pep Guardiola and the way that he plays the game and uh, his management style and being able to watch those Amazon documentaries on, on Man City and seeing the, the behind the scenes stuff. And I think one of those two would probably be my answer. Great. And, uh, you know, I love Pep Guardiola and would love to spend a day with him and just, you know, the impact on what he's done to the game. Um, but you might have already, you know, answered this, but who is your role model? Um, I probably have two. I, I'd say off the field, uh, You know, my wife is definitely a role model of mine. You know, she keeps me moving. She keeps me motivated. uh, Definitely keeps me 
uh, in check and then probably on the field, you know, the way that I want to play, probably Pep Guardiola would probably be, uh, you know, someone that, that um, I would love to be able to, A, have the players he has and to be able to have the mind he has. And, you know, I think we all try and copy and paste a little bit of coaching into ours. So I think that that's probably, it's probably one that I, that I would love to be around. Love it. Um, if when this you know episode comes out, when it comes out, you know there's a great bit that you can clip there and show to your wife and just have in your back pocket there. Look, so well played. Um, love that. Um, if you could have been a full time professional player or a full time professional coach at Guardiola's level, which one would you have chosen? Um, you know, the original reason I got into coaching was because I couldn't play any longer, um, couldn't advance any longer. Um, but I think now at this point in my life, I think I'd rather be a full-time coach. Um, I love the chess match that, that being a coach is and being able to move pieces and, you know, being able to have that 360 view of the game rather than as a player when, um, you know, you're kind of focused in the moment. Um, but I think now probably a full-time coach and, um, you know, being able to move pieces around and play chess with, with the game that I love, so, so to say, so. Uh, yeah, probably a coach. Brilliant, and that's exactly why I coach, because I can play a game of football now and say uh, a team, and I'll just lose interest because I want to be pushing players left, right, and centre, and I want to yeah. be making changes, and suddenly I've lost the player that I'm supposed to be marking, and <laughs> that's because my head's gone. Um, and yeah. final one, what is the one thing you enjoy most about coaching? Oh, um, certainly the relationships that I've gotten from the game. Um, you know, there's also, I've met a lot of great people. I've coached a lot of great players. Um, but you know, I, I, there's obviously, I enjoy, like I said, the tactical, the analysis, the recruitment, uh, I love everything that comes with coaching. Um, but you know, the people that I've been around and the, the programs that I've worked with and the players that I've worked with and to see them, you know, some of them move on in their playing career and some of them move on in more of a professional um, workforce career and to see them continue to advance so um, definitely the the relationships that I've been able to grow throughout the game brilliant and well that that sums up the the episode that we've recorded and um, but I am appreciative of your time I'm glad we could get this organized I'm glad that you've wanted to come on and um, you know it, it's mostly just been a conversation which has just you know flowed from the moment that we came on and um, we haven't really sort of touched the surface in terms of a lot of other elements and um, you know a lot that I have planned but it, it's great because we've naturally been able to just have those conversations around what what, who you are and where you're going, what you want to do, the experiences. Right. And um, that's what it's all about is around you. But um, I'd love to have you on again in the future where we could actually touch into some more details and things. But um, honestly, I'm so grateful that you, you've come on today and um, thank you for your time. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like I said, anything to help uh, grow the game, grow the podcast, you know, be a little help coaches be, um, you know, if, if there's any, I've gotten so much from other coaches that if I can give a little bit back to other people, I, I'm all for it. Um, yeah, I would love to come on again. And anytime you have availability, let, let's do it. We'll make it happen. Love that. Definitely get you on again. And, uh, well, good, good luck with everything. Best wishes to your family and, uh, uh, play this back to your wife. But, um, it's a, it's a big thanks from me and, um, thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. We'll chat soon. Definitely. All right. Have a good one. And you, bye.